Greetings! Welcome to this online session. My name is George Schmidt and you can find me at the support team of Sophistic where I'm dealing with customers in queries and working as a consultant engineer on a daily basis. I will be performing to you this online Sophistic training on the basic functionalities of our software through a post-tension beam bridge example. This training contains several blocks from which this is the first one. To successfully finish the course, the only prerequisite you need is to know the basic of AutoCAD commands. All the remaining will be explained by me in detail. Do not worry. As you can experience, this is a recorded video and therefore I'm not available for live questions during the session. However, after you have reviewed the course, please feel free to send us your question or doubts to the training at sophistic.de email address. In the next slide, let me introduce myself a little bit. I have graduated on the Budapest University of Technology and Economics on the Faculty of Civil Engineering in 1999. So you can figure out now that originally I'm from Budapest, Hungary. After the university, I started to work as a bridge engineer at the MSC Limited company in Budapest. I worked there for 12 years and I learned the basics of design engineering. I made a lot of drawings and I made a lot of calculations, uh, mainly in bridges. When I felt myself confident enough as a design engineer, I thought I might need to try out myself abroad. So I moved to Hong Kong and I worked there for three years as a senior design engineer at URS Benaim Limited. In Hong Kong, I was designing mainly temporary structures for contractors. It was also very, very interesting for me and I learned a lot regarding temporary structures and the whole business about construction. After 15 years of designing structures, I thought maybe I should try out myself in a different field as well. I always like to be involved in the static analysis part of the design and I liked to use the finite element softwares a lot. So one of my obvious choices was to go and work as a consultant for a finite element software company. And this is how I ended up at Sophistic AG in Nuremberg. Okay, now, after my personal introduction, let's discuss what you can expect from this course. Okay, let's briefly discuss what you will learn in block number one. Well, if you go through the whole content, you will be able to use all of the program modules of the Sophistic Finite Element software, create simple and a little bit more complex models, define loadings, perform various types of analysis, undertake the most important design checks on the elements according to the Eurocode family. And I'm also going to give you some guidance about the best practice to reach your goals. As I mentioned previously, to successfully uh, finish the course, the only prerequisite you need is to know the basic AutoCAD commands knowledge. Of course, it doesn't mean that you need to be an expert in AutoCAD. We are just going to use the, some very, very easy and basic commands like drawing a line, moving an object, copy an object, maybe mirror one object or another. Then, first and foremost, I'm going to give you an overview about the used modules within Sophistic. Here you will meet a lot of new terms of the modules, but do not worry, I'm just going to mention the most important ones. And later on, as you are get familiarized yourself with Sophistic, you will know these module names and new terms automatically. Then I'm going to introduce to you the Sophistic programs, such as the Sophistic Structural Desktop, SSD, the System Visualization, tool, the report browser, the graphics, result viewer, and finally the teddy. Then I will explain how the elements and their meshing is working in Sophistic. Then after the theoretical part, I'm going to introduce you the project file that we are going to model together. Finally, we are going to start our new project. And by doing that, we are going to learn the basics of the Sophistic Structural Desktop SSD. Defining the most important materials for our model, I'm also going to mention some material types and how to define them. And finally, I'm going to talk about the standard and arbitrary shaped cross-sections 
and how to define them. I hope you will enjoy the course as much as I am glad to present it to you. So let's get quickly jump into it. After having gone through the general information, let me describe the general workflow and applications of Sophistic. First and foremost, Sophistic is a modular based software, which means that different modules are communicating back and forth to the database. This is what can be seen in this first slide as well. You can realize that we have three different type of modules. I mark them with different colors. The pre-processing types marked with light blue color. The processing type of modules marked by green color. And the post-processing type of modules marked with light green. These modules are working behind the Sophistic programs, such as, for example, the Sophistic Structural Desktop, or the Sophie Plus, or the System Visualization, or the Report Browser, WinGraph, or Result Viewer. These are the programs that we are going to meet in our session, and I'm going to teach you how to use each of them within Sophistic. Maybe the terms and the expression of the program names and module names are going to be a little bit strange at the very beginning, but do not worry. Later on, you are going to get used to it, even to the names of the modules. In the next slide, I would like to show you what can we do with these modules. First of all, we can create our structural model. Then we can apply loads on the structure within actions. Then we can analyze the structure. Then we can superimpose the results of the analysis. We can perform the design of the elements in the system. And finally, we can evaluate the results and make our final documentation. Please pay attention to the small arrows in this slide, which try to symbolize the communication between the modules and the central database. The extension of the central database is always the project name .cdb. And you can find this file in the project folder. Now, as we see and understand the operation of the modules, it enables us to understand how important it is in which order or sequence we are executing the modules. Say, for example, we have created our model and then we would like to perform an analysis. But it's not possible because we haven't yet defined the loads on our structure. Similarly, if you want to perform the design of the elements in the system, we can only do that if we superimpose the results. Otherwise, we are going to get a warning message that there are no available results. I know it seems to be very obvious, but believe me, later on when you are going to get some warnings or error from Sophistic, this little slide will help you to understand what's going on and what is the problem with your current model. In the coming slides, I'm going to explain the functionality and the names of the modules underlying these programs. Primarily, I'm going to explain or mention only the modules that we are going to use in this example file. And maybe I will give a little bit of overview about other modules that could be necessary for other modelings later on. So in the next slide, I first would like to talk about the preprocessing modules. So I have mentioned that the modules are communicating with the database but I haven't mentioned the way. Basically, the modules can communicate with each other either through standard text files or through graphical interfaces. The text files can be created in Teddy, and the language that we can use to instruct the software is the so-called CADIMP language, which is a very powerful command language. It allows, for example, full operation of the possibilities of certain modules in the analysis. Experienced users use flexible CADIMP macros to simplify the data input, especially when entering complex systems. Also, it is very commonly used when we want to parameterize our input. 
we can use so-called templates, which are basically interactive worksheets where we need to just input the parameters of the structure. And from these given parameters, the geometry of the model will be automatically created. On the other hand, SophiePlus is a graphic preprocessor which is used to create the structure in the form of structural elements. With its help, an AutoCAD drawing will be converted into structural elements. The program is based on AutoCAD. So as a user, you will experience an AutoCAD environment in which you can very easily work with AutoCAD commands. The most common commands that you are going to use, like drawing a line with line command, or copy, or move, or rotate, or mirror. With these basic commands, it is very, very easy to create even a complex model. Also, a great number of functions easily permit to convert the basic AutoCAD entities into structural elements and loads. As a preprocessor, SophiePlus creates the input file, which is later used by adequate SophiStick modules, in this case, module SophiMesh C, which describes the structural elements in the system. So, to sum up, SophiePlus is the right product for any user who wants to use the functionality of the SophiStick analysis programs with the help of AutoCAD. Okay, and what is the difference between SophiePlus and SophiePlus minus X? Basically, if your company already bought AutoCAD and installed on your computers, then what you need to install is purely the Sophie Plus. It is nothing more than an inbuilt sidebar in the AutoCAD uh, environment with which you can create your structural elements such as structural points, structural lines and structural areas. On the other hand, if your company is using a third-party software to create the construction drawings, then what you need to buy and install is Sophie Plus X. This is a standalone software with an AutoCAD OAM kernel. It absolutely looks like a full AutoCAD, but not every command is available in Sophie Plus X. For example, it's not possible to print from Sophie Plus X. But the way how you can create your structural elements in Sophie Plus X and in Sophie Plus is absolutely the same. Okay, so Sophie Plus is our primary graphical user interface tool to create uh, our models. But let's see which modules or which module is working in the background of Sophie Plus. Basically, this module is nothing more than the so called Sophie Mesh C module. With the help of this module, we are creating structural elements, and after discretizing the structural elements, we are going to get the finite elements with which we are going to work finally. Besides this approach, it is also possible to create directly finite elements with module SophieMesh A, but it is only possible with the help of text input. In the next slide, I would like to talk about the processing type of modules. I will just simply mention the name and describe the possibilities. With module Aqua, you can define and create the materials and the cross sections in your system. Aqua calculates the properties of cross sections of any shape and made out of any material. Of course, it is possible to define the cross section graphically in Sophie Plus and also with the help of text input. You can even create parameterized cross section based upon a variable built in the cross section. After the definition with module Aqua, the cross sections can be represented graphically with the result viewer, which we are going to cover later on. The next main module that we are going to use frequently is module Sophie Load. In the graphical user interface of Sophie Plus, you can create your load cases and define different type of loads. And in the background, basically, this module Sophie Load is going to create the loads for further usage in the analysis. With the help of this module, one can create so-called element loads and free loads 
which we are going to discuss what is the difference between these two. Apart from these functionalities that I mentioned, loads are organized into load cases, which are members of a unique action. So basically, load cases and actions are also generated with the help of Sophie load. There are also possibilities to generate loads from results in the database. These are especially, for example, support forces converted to loads, or imperfections, or creep deformations, or pre-stressing effects. However, in this course, we are going to present the simple nodal and element loads only. Next, module tendon is used to define the pre-stressing for breams or shell elements. In addition to the calculation of the pre-stressing geometry, the module computes the pre-stressing forces, taking into consideration the pre-stressing process and the friction losses. The pre-stressing effect in beam structures is computed as statically determined pre-stress by means of curvature loads, which are stored in the database as loads of a particular load case. In case of shell structures, the pre-stress geometry for each tendon is computed over the applicable elements and stored in the database. This means that uh, the tendon will go through shell elements and the pre-stressing force in these shell elements are going to be stored and used later on. The elastic effects can be computed later on with the appropriate static modules of Sophistic such as ASE or CSM. The three letter CSM stands for the Construction Stage Manager. With the help of this module, a construction sequence can be defined and analyzed. And as I mentioned, the tendons can be automatically activated within a given construction stage. This module also analyzes the creep problems that can be defined and controlled in an easy way in this module. In the background, the CSM program produces an input file for module ASE and for module AQB. So what it does actually is to create a recipe for module ASE and for module AQB, which I'm going to show you later on. This module is also very important for you when you want to activate or deactivate a part of your structure. Basically, you can assign your model into groups and with the help of module CSM, you can simply activate or deactivate these groups in the analysis. And as I mentioned, CSM perform the analysis with the help of module ASE the shortening stands for Advanced Solution Engine. And basically, this is the main solver of Sophistic. Basically, it calculates the static and dynamic effect of general loading on any type of structure. The module handles haunched beam elements, springs, cables, truss elements, plane, triangular or quadrilateral shell elements, and three-dimensional continuum elements, volume elements, if you want to say. Also, it handles the structures with rigid or elastic types of support. The elastic support can be applied to an area or a line or at a nodal point. Rigid elements or skew supports can be taken into account as well. This module is even capable of taking into account the primary a stress strain condition of a previous load case and that is why it can work together with the construction stage manager and cos considers the primary stress strain condition of a previous load case. Nonlinear calculations enables the user to take the failure of particular elements into account such as cables in compression, uplifting of supported plates, yielding friction, or crack effects for spring and foundation elements. Nonlinear materials are available for three-dimensional volume elements and channel elements too.
Geometrical nonlinear computations allow the investigation of second and third order theory effects by cable, beam, shell, and volume structures. As you can see, module ASE has a very broad variety of capabilities, and I didn't even mention, for example, for beam structures, the program can calculate warping torsion with up to 7 degrees of freedom per node. In our example file, we are going to extensively use module ASE, but only with the basic capabilities will be used. Okay, now let's move on to the next module, which is module Dyna. This module is for primarily dynamic analysis of three-dimensional structures. For example, one can calculate the natural frequencies of three-dimensional structures with it, or you can calculate the buckling eigenvalues of three-dimensional structures, or you can undertake implicit direct integration of the equations of motion for structures with arbitrary damping, or perform explicit direct integration of the nonlinear equations of motion. We can also calculate interaction between our structure and load trains and wind loading, for example. And also this module is working in the background when we make a response spectrum analysis for earthquake. The third solution engine in sophistic finite elements after ASE Dyna is called module Talpa. The main focus of Talpa is the numerical analysis of geotechnical related tasks and soil mechanics. It allows for linear and nonlinear analysis of stresses and deformations for arbitrary shaped plane structures that are loaded in plane, so the plane stress or plane strain conditions are applicable. And also we can calculate axisymmetric three-dimensional structures with it. The next module is called STAR. Basically this is the predecessor of module ASE. It's capable of uh, analyzing uh, 3D beam structures, taking into account second and third order theory. Module Hase is a very interesting module. It adopts a so-called substructuring technique, which means the structure will be represented using standard finite elements, while the soil will be modeled semi-analytically using the so-called half-space theory. The connection between the two substructures will be assured by stiffness or flexibility coefficients at the soil structure interface nodes. With this approach, one can take into consideration the shear deformations of the soil and it doesn't require explicit discrete modeling of the entire soil domain in the form of volume elements. So you can spare a lot of running time. All you need to do is to define the so-called ball profile uh, in the model based upon the real survey on site and module Hase will create the stiffness matrix based upon these parameters. The interaction between the subsoil and the superstructure finally is going to be undertaken with the help of module ASE. The use case of this module is for example when you have a building and you want to calculate the deflection of the surrounding soil or when you want to calculate the influence on the deflection of the soil coming from another building in the vicinity. Okay, now let's move on to the next module, Hydra. A great number of physical problems may be described as potential problems covered by the Laplace or the Poisson differential equation. Among these problems are magnetic flow, heat flow or groundwater seepage. Module Hydra is specialized on the heat flow and the groundwater seepage problems. But it could be also used for other problems with a similar background as well. Module Ella is for the analysis and evaluation of imposed loads that acts on a 3D beam or shell structure in the form of load trains which move along certain traffic lanes along the structure. Usually the result is the envelope diagram of the internal forces for the entire structure, so for every single element in the system. 
Ella evaluates the influence lines or the influence surfaces of a 3D structure. Basically, the entire surface of the structure on which the imposed loads are acting will be divided into straight or curved lanes with variable width. Any load trains can be assigned then to these lanes. They can move independently or in, rela in relation to each other. The traffic lanes are defined with axes which may contain circular segments or clotoids as well. The loading refers always to the lane axis. An influence line is generated for a vertical loading along the lane's axis for each lane as well as for a moment loading about the same axis due to the eccentrical parts. Maybe one more important note is that the module evaluates the influence lines only for corresponding traffic lanes, even in the case of plane structures. The next module, called SIR, is a very unique one. Let's suppose you have a model made out of only shell elements, for example, and you would like to get the internal forces in the system, because as a result of your analysis, the available results are only stresses in the quad elements, but you cannot do too much with that, because the checks, according to the Euro code, or other codes as well, needs to be undertaken on the level of internal forces. So what can you do in this case? You need to use module SIR. This module generates cross-sections, uh, integrate the stresses into internal forces and moments, which can be used directly by other program modules, for example, Aqua or AQB, and with those you can design your structure. Maybe this figure shows you better uh, how the module SIR works. As you can see, you need to set up a new sectional plane uh, with, a, with an orientation. It means that you need to create the local X, local Y, local Z coordinate system of this sectional plane. Then you need to define the extent of this cut in the Y direction and in the global Z direction as well. And then the module is going to make the rest for you. So it means from a certain load case, it's going to integrate the stresses into internal forces and moments. The next program module that we are going to use extensively in our example file is called Maxima. The results which were calculated with other modules are stored in the database. The task of module Maxima is the determination of the extreme values of the internal forces, stresses, displacements, and support reactions. To do that, we use the partial safety concept of the Euro codes and international codes, but also we can work according to the conventional method without partial safety factors to determine the maximum values within the system. So Maxima basically finds the most unfavorable action effect and applies the combination factors automatically. To achieve this, the superposition is done in two steps. In the inner step, module Maxima finds the extreme value from different load cases of the action. And in the second procedure, the actions are combined according to the code. Finally, module columns and footings among the processing type of modules are two design modules with which we can design columns or footings in our system. Now let's overview the post-processing type of modules in Sophistic. The first module that we are going to also use in this example file extensively is module AQB. The enhanced versions of AQB module AQBS allows the consideration of special features of pre-stressed concrete and composite structures. For example, the pre-stressing tendons, imposed secondary stresses, creep and shrinkage, or other effects can be considered with this special module. When I mentioned the design of a cross-section, what I meant is to calculate the necessary amount of reinforcement within a cross-section against the most severe load case or load case effects. The other post-processing tool for design is called module BMS, with which we can undertake the design of shell elements in our system. 
And again, the design refers to the calculation of the necessary amount of reinforcement in ULS state or in SLS state. With both of these design modules, with AQB and with BMS, it's also possible to undertake a crack with check or a check for minimum reinforcement, uh, various stress checks, and also fatigue checks. Module BMS is even capable of performing a punching check at point supports as well as at wall corners or wall ends. The next module is the so-called BDK module, which provides solution to the problem of beam stability. It determines the stability eigenvalues for buckling of a straight individual member. The member, which is taken from the entire system, is calculated with module ASA, and the buckling resistance check of steel member is performed according to the specified design code. So basically, you need to define the system selecting straight individual beams or truss elements, which are then cut out of the entire system and will be treated independently uh, with module BDK. The module allows you to define uh, support conditions at the start and at the end of each selected individual beam. But of course, you can also define continuous supports, offering a complete control on the properties of the selected system. And the standard related design parameters can be also explicitly defined by you. OK, having went through all the design modules among the post-processing modules, let's move on to the modules with which we can represent our structure and the results. As you can see, we have four main modules to do that. The first one is called System Visualization, or the old name for that is Animator. This is basically an interactive system viewer built in SSD, with which you can have a look at the model, the system, but also primary results of your system. The next module is called WindGraph, which is a very powerful and very robust module for graphical representation of the system and the results. With the help of WindGraph, we can double check our system input, for example, the finite elements, the beams, the shells in our system, but also we can represent every result of the model. We have a special module for representing the graphical results and also the tabular results of the cross sections. This module is called the result viewer. During the course, I, I will explain, of course, which representation is the best to use for certain cases. Finally, I need to mention the module called Report Browser. This is the module where we can print or plot the textual results of our system. Basically, this module is our main goal or final goal. In the Report Browser, we are going to create a static report for the reviewer or for the checker engineer. Every necessary input and also output should be incorporated in this report. During the analysis, of course, you can also double check yourself by using the report browser. All the individual modules that I mentioned previously can have an output in the report browser. And in this way, the reviewer has a chance to understand your input and output as well. OK, basically that concludes the post-processing type of modules. Let's move on to the data exchange type of modules. So an exchange of data or interface to the database is possible with these modules here. For example, we have a very powerful interface for Revit structures. This is also very similar to Sophie Plus, which means you can create a graphical representation of your module model and you are able to export this information into the database where you can continue working on your model with different calculation tasks or design tasks. It's also possible to export and import IFC data from or to a third party program. The supported type of EFC data is the structure analysis view, the so-called IFC 
2 times 3. Of course, with the help of Sophie Plus, you can also interact or interfere with the database in the form of DWG files and TXF files. For example, you can import a DWG file and based upon this information, you can create your structural elements in Sophie Plus. It is also possible to create ASCII input with which you can communicate with the database as well. And if you are an expert programmer, then you can also interact with the language Visual Basic, C++ or Fortran to the database. Now with a little bit of more knowledge of the modules, let's go through the general workflow of Sophistic once more. So first we need to crea create our structural model with the help of Sophie Plus, where we define the cross sections with module Aqua and we create the structural elements with module Sophie Mesh C. Then we apply loads on our structure, which are assigned to actions. All it's happening within Sophie load. Then we perform an analysis with the help of one of our solution engines, for example, the advanced solution engine. Then we superimpose the results of this analysis with the help of module Maxima. If we want to perform a nonlinear analysis, then we need to create a new load case where we copy in the individual load cases and run this new load case with the help of module ASE again. In one way or another, the results will be available for us to undertake the design of the elements in our system, such as the beams with the help of module AQB or the shell elements, quad elements with the help of module BMS. Finally, we can evaluate or documentate our results with the help of different modules, for example, with the system visualization tool, the report browser, WinGraph, or the result viewer. And this information concludes the overview of the used modules in Sophistic. After having looked at the Sophistic modules, now I would like to go through the Sophistic programs that we are going to use in our training. The first one, and maybe the most important one, is the Sophistic Structural Desktop. Shortly, I'm just going to refer to this as SSD. So in this slide, now you can see the user interface of SSD. And on the left side, you can see the so-called project navigation window. Or sometimes I'm also referring to this as a task tree. Because what we can see is actually the tasks that we would like to run later on. If we create a new project and choose the code according to which we are going to work, some predefined tasks will be automatically added to this task tree or project navigation panel. Of course, if you want to, you can add or remove any of these tasks later on. On the right side, we can see the so-called working area which by default shows you the system that had been exported from Sophie Plus to the database. And this window is the so-called system visualization or with the old name animator. The icon of the system visualization is kind of a colorful butterfly. In the working area, you can have a first overview of your structure. You can, for example, check or review if your definition in Sophie Plus was correct, this is really the model that you wanted to create. Whether or not the orientation of the finite elements are correct, the support conditions are according to your taste, and so on and so forth. Apart from the inspection of the structure, the SSD provides its most important feature, which is basically to communicate between the most important sophistic programs, such as graphics, result viewer, and report browser, and the text editor. So to summarize, SSD is the control center of Sophistic programs. In this next slide, you can see that the working area can be changed into a protocol of analysis. This means when you run any of the modules, this area will change automatically, and it's going to present the protocol of the run 
modules. In the top left corner you can see the names of the modules and a small square next to the name of the modules. If the square contains a minus sign it means this module is not going to be run. When you change it by clicking on it to a plus sign then the module will be analyzed when you click on the calculation button. In this case for example you can see two modules were calculated namely module ASE and module WING, which is the WING graph. You can also notice a small sign next to the module names, in this case a green circle with a check in the middle. This sign means that the modules were calculated without any errors or warnings, so everything is in OK. If you had a warning next to one of the modules, then you should see an orange circle with an exclamation mark within it. With the warnings, the software tries to call your attention that something is not OK or could be not OK. For example, try to imagine a slab on which you have a uniformly distributed area load. But in the slab, there is an opening. When you run the analysis, in this case, you are going to get a warning that not 100% of the loading was applied on the structure. Therefore, only a portion of the original load was applied. Of course, in this case, this type of warning message can be neglected. But generally speaking, I suggest you removing all the warnings from your analysis by finding out what is the reason behind the warnings and amend it. The third type of sign that can be seen next to the module name is a red circle with a cross in it. This means an error in the analysis or in the run of that particular module. Such an error can happen, for example, if you define a structure, apply the loads on it, but the support condition of the structure is not sufficient and the structure is not stable enough to withstand the loading. In this case, when you perform the analysis with module ASE, you are going to get an error message that the system is not stable and cannot withstand the loading anymore. You can also neglect this error message and continue the analysis after the error if you check in this box, but I absolutely do not recommend it to you. This will lead to faulty results. Uh, in the last column of the protocol of the analysis, you can see the spent time on each module. Sometimes the procedure of one module is so quick that you can only able to see zero seconds next to it. After having run the single load cases, you can go back to the system visualization and the primary results of your structure will be available for you. You can see on the left side that now it's not only the system representation is available for you, but also the single load cases. For example, load case number one, two, three, four in this case. I would like to emphasize that the system visualization tool is only giving you primary results. What I mean is that do not use this system visualization window to seriously consider the stresses, for example, presented in the top left corner. These stresses are just average stresses calculated with the formula N over A plus M over W. But do not consider any special effects such as pre-stressing or creep and shrinkage in the quad elements. However, which you can be sure of, is the overall reaction forces in the system from the certain load case that are presented here with some Rx, some Ry, and some Rz. These are precisely calculated and presented in the system visualization. The outlook of your structure can be controlled in the system visualization with these some icons here in the top row, which I'm going to talk about later. The next sophistic program I would like to talk about is the report browser. This is the program which we can use to create our final report for the reviewer or for the checker engineer. We can collect here every information regarding the input or the output. 
The structure of the result viewer can be seen on the left side. You can see the module name and the title of the module and you can see the chapters of the output of this module. Please notice that there are some small book icons next to, next to the chapters. If this book icon is open, it means that the content of the chapter will be printed in the output. Also, I would like to call your attention that by default the input data chapter is closed, so the input data is by default cannot be seen. Sometimes it is a difficult task to decide which chapter to be presented and which chapter should be closed. A good suggestion could be if you look at the overall number of pages and if you find it too many, then you can close some of the chapters to enable the reviewer or the reader to be able to go through the content of the report. I would like to also point out that sometimes the report contains pictures as well, or we can also call them graphics. If the text is too small in this graphic, or you simply want to zoom in to this graphic, then I suggest you to go to the graphic tabs here, which shows all the graphics one by one that are presented in your report. And it might give you a better overview of your graphics. Similarly to other text browsers or text viewers, you can see your A4 page with the page width zoomed into the screen or the page height zoomed into the screen. In the report browser, you also have the possibility to search for the errors in your model and also to search for the warnings in your model. Sometimes these features are very handy because you can follow along and read better the errors or the warnings in the report rather than in the system visualization. The next Sophistic program that we are going to use intensively in the course is the graphics. The old name for that is WinGraph and you can see the icon of it here. In this slide you can see the user interface of WinGraph and also the representation of some kind of a result in this case. For example, at the moment I'm presenting the necessary amount of reinforcement in the lower principal reinforcement layer from design case 1. This information, by the way, is always printed on the A4 paper at the bottom part. As I mentioned in the graphics, it's not just possible to print out or represent the results of the structure, but it is also possible to print the input of the structure such as the structural elements or the nodes in the system or one by one the quadrilateral elements, beam elements, springs and so on and so forth. We can also represent the loads in the system and then the results as you can see here. Graphic is a very powerful tool and I'm going to elaborate its features later on separately. There is only one thing that graphics is not so good at and it is the representation of the results of the cross-sections. However, for this special demand, we developed the program Result Viewer. The icon of the Result Viewer is a table, as you can see here, and one of its main features is show and represent the input of the cross-sections and the output of the cross-sections. In the Result Viewer, it's possible to create graphics, but you can also create table representations for the results. In one of its new feature, now the result viewer is also capable of creating diagrams. For example, bending moment diagrams along structural lines. All of the results can be very easily exported from the result viewer to Microsoft Excel. This enables the user to make their own design with the help of Excel spreadsheets. The navigation in the new result viewer is very similar to the graphics. First, we are going to cover how to control the graphics, and then it will be very easy for you later on to navigate and control result viewer. In this next slide, I would like to uh, show you how the table representation looks like in result viewer. 
the usability of these tables are very similar to Excel. So for example, you can filter this data according to columns and so on and so forth. Also, please notice that here we are also working like in graphics. We have one A4 paper on which we can have graphics or tables. One of the most inevitable sophistic program is our text editor, the so-called Teddy. In one way or in another, you must meet with Teddy at some point of your sophistic journey. At this point of the training, I just would like to point out that in the text editor, we are working with the so-called Kedim language. This language is a simplified yet very powerful programming language for civil engineers to facilitate their needs in the creation of the model. What you should notice here that here again we are meeting with the program module names such as ASE or Wing. We can see some commands with the dark blue colors. We can also see some options of the commands and some values given with black color. With the green color you can see the commands in Teddy which helps you orientate yourself later on when you reopen the text input. You can use the text editor as a standalone program or as you can see here embedded in SSD. After having run one of the graphical tasks and you right click on the task then you have the possibility to look behind this graphical task and this is what is presented at the moment on the screen. For example, now we can see that the linear analysis task contains a run of module ASE, ASE, and module WING. This is one way to learn, for example, the input of the CADIMP language when you show behind one of or more of the graphical tasks. In the next slide, I would like to talk about the program SOFI Plus. This is the graphical user in interface of model input. You can use either SOFI Plus or SOFI Plus X. What you are going to experience in your environment is this so-called SOFI Plus sidebar. On top, you can see the ribbon with the commands, which are exactly the same as you have in AutoCAD, even if you use SOFI Plus X. Of course, if you use SOFI Plus, then everything is the same. Basically, you are using the AutoCAD. The only change is this SOFI Plus sidebar on the left side. This sidebar contains the commands of SOFI Plus. With the help of these commands, you can create structural elements, you can apply loads on the structure, you can perform pre-stressing on the structure, and of course you have the possibility to make the, some settings. To create your model, on the right side you can see the so-called working area, where you have plenty of space to create your model. On the bottom side you can find a so-called command line. This command line is to enter your commands and do not use the icons if you don't want to because the input with the commands are much faster. And the command line is also a place where you can get feedback from the system what should be the next step or what did you do wrong. However, I will explain in detail the functionalities of SOFI Plus later on when we start to create our model together. And basically this concludes the introduction of the sophistic programs. And now we are going to continue with the elements and meshing. Okay, so let's talk about the elements and meshing in sophistic. In the next slide I'm going to talk about the principle of the mesh generation with the program SOFI+. Plus. So the common workflow is to work in SOFI Plus and create our model graphically on the basis of AutoCAD commands in SOFI Plus. In SOFI Plus we are going to work with the so-called structural elements like structural points, structural lines and structural areas. 
we can export this information to the database, but we can also import this kind of information into our drawing into the Sophie Plus. So basically, this is a bidirectional connection to the central database in terms of the structural elements. Let me elaborate this procedure a little bit more with the help of one structural element, one structural line. So let's suppose that in Sophie Plus, I'm going to create one structural line with a length of 10 meter. First, I just need to click at the beginning of the structural line and at the end of the structural line and assign some properties to this structural line, for example, a cross section. Now, please pay attention to my wording. The expressions that I'm going to use are very, very important. Since we are working in a finite element software, our final goal is to create the finite elements from these structural elements. So when I'm talking about the meshing procedure, I'm referring to the way how the software creates the finite elements from the structural elements. This means that the structural element will be internally meshed and discretized into small finite elements, as you can see in this slide as well. For example, from this one structural line, after the discretization, I'm going to get 11 finite element beams. The total length of my model didn't change. What is change is the type of the elements and also the number of the elements. OK, now let's have a look at the structural element types and the related finite elements one by one. On the left side, you can see that we have three main type of structural elements, the structural point, the structural line, and the structural area. With a structural point, we can model, for example, very easily a point support or a spring at a certain node. But it is also very useful to define a structural point if we want to apply a point load on our structure. If we have already defined two structural points, then we can create an elastic link in between. The elastic link is nothing more than an elastic spring between the structural points. But we can also define a constraint between two structural points. It means an infinitely rigid spring between the structural points. With the help of the structural lines, we can create the reference axis of our beams or our columns. But we can also use it to create boundary conditions along a line. If we have defined two structural lines, we can create an elastic link in between or a rigid constraint, very similarly that I had mentioned with two structural points. It's also possible to create structural areas, of course, with these structural areas, we can model uh, slabs, but also vertical walls, as we want to. We can even define so-called openings in our area. Either it is a horizontal area or a vertical area. Still, we are able to create an opening in it. An opening is nothing more than also a structural area with a very special material definition. Namely, this very special material is material zero, which means no material. There is also the possibility to define the so-called attribute areas. With an attribute area, we can change a certain property of an already defined structural area. For example, I have defined one structural area with a thickness of 300 millimeter. Then I create an attribute area over this already defined structural area. And the only property I would like to change is the thickness from 300 millimeter to 150 millimeter. This is something that you can very easily undertake with the help of attribute areas. OK, as we discussed now, the type of the structural elements that we can create in Sophie Plus, let's see what type of finite elements we are going to get after the discretization. From a structural point, after the meshing procedure, we are going to get a so-called finite element node. From a structural line, after the meshing procedure, we are going to get either a beam or a column. But we can also receive a truss element or a cable element. 
when we defined boundary condition to the structural lines, then it's going to become a boundary element after the discretization. From the structural area elements, we are going to get so-called finite area elements, but I'm going to refer these as quad elements. The reason behind is that by default, the structural areas are going to be discretized into an area element, which has four nodes at the corner, and hence the name quad element. In previous versions of Sophistic, it was possible to define finite elements directly and explicitly, but in version 2018 and 20, this is not possible anymore. We always need to start first with the structural element definitions, and after the meshing procedure, we are going to get the finite elements. That is what I try to refer here with the no manual meshing inside Sophie Plus available anymore. Okay, now let's see how the automatic mesh generation with the help of module Sophie Mesh C works. I am presenting a simple example on the right side of my screen. I tried to create a simple building with one ground slab, with the first floor slab, and with some columns in between. As you can see, the slabs were created with the help of structural areas, whereas the columns were defined with structural lines. So what we just created, or what I have just created, is a wireframe model of the real structure. And this is something very important to notice, that with the structural elements, create the wireframe system of the entire structure. Then internally the intersection will be found by the software. For example, the intersection at the corner of the structural area and the structural line. But the other not so obvious intersections will be found as well, for example, here at the structural line and the slab and here as well. With the help of the following slides, I would like to explain the procedure of the meshing procedure. The meshing procedure basically has three steps. The first one is to create the system geometry. The second one is to create the structural elements. And the third one is to make the discretization and create the finite elements. So in the first step, we create the system geometry. So we draw the structural area, for example, area number one. At this stage, we have independent objects in our model. However, in the next stage, the structural elements related objects will be created. Let me talk a little bit about this procedure in detail. The creation of the related objects means the following. After having defined the structural areas, the software internally will create structural points and structural lines made out of this structural area. You can see the internal structural points with green color here and the internal structural lines with light blue color. The numbering of these related objects is created automatically by the software. Of course, the same is applicable for a structural line. Internally, two structural points will be created and one structural line in between. Then finally, in the last step, these structural points and structural lines will create or define the small quad elements in the system. So all the three steps can be seen in this slide. And it tries to summarize what we just discussed. So first we create the system geometry, then the related objects will be created automatically, and finally the finite elements will be also established by the software. This whole procedure can be triggered from Sophie Plus simply clicking on the export button. And from this whole complex procedure, you are only going to see that the module Sophie Mesh C and module Aqua is working in the background. But I wanted you to understand how it is happening. And also it is very important later on when I'm referring to structure elements or finite elements to understand what these terms mean. But since you understand now the difference, we can move on to the introduction of our model. 
In this part, I would like to introduce you the model that we are going to create together in this course. What I can suggest to you is always create such a drawing that I am presenting at the moment to you on the screen. It helps you to identify the possible difficulties or problems during the creation of the model. So, just take your time, have a seat, take a piece of paper and a pencil, and sketch up the project that you would like to model. This is also what I did for this project and I would like to go through the steps that I considered. As you can see, our structure is a two-span beam bridge. It is also important to mention that this is a road bridge and not a railroad bridge. The spans are equal with 26.6 meter. There is a cantilever part at the beginning and at the end with 700 millimeter. At the middle support of our structure we can see a robust concrete pier and we can also notice that we have bearings on top of the piers and at the end and at the beginning of the structure. The width of the concrete superstructure is 6 meter at the top and 2.2 meter at the bottom. So the superstructure has also a 1.9 meter cantilever part on both sides. The other important properties to consider are the span lengths and the span stations. Uh, I think the span length is easy to understand. With these values we are defining the length of the span of the structure. But what is the span station value? Well, the answer is that we are going to define our structure along a main axis. So first we need to create this main axis and this axis has real chainage values. These chainage values can be also called or named as stations. So the access of the beginning of the structure is going to happen at station 10.0. Then we have a 70 centimeter long cantilever part so if I add the 10 meter plus the 0 0.7 meter I'm going to be at station 10.70 then if I add 26.6 meter to the 10.7 meter I'm going to be at 37.30 meter and again I'm going to add the 26.6 meter and the 0 0.7 meter cantilever part Finally, I will be at station 64.6 meter. It is always a good practice to start your structure at a little bit further away from the zero station of the axis. The reason behind is the following. If your structure is skewed in top view and you want to move along, for example, a predefined load train on the axis of the bridge, the first position of the load train will always be at station 0.0, .0 meter. And if your structure is a skewed one, and also the excess of the beginning of the superstructure is at 0.0, .0 meter, then it could happen that the part of the predefined load tray will not be applied fully with 100% on the structure. The other reason is to start the station value a little bit further away from the starting point of the axis is that sometimes you figure out that you want to add something to the structure on both ends and in this case you have some space to do that. So after considering the global geometry you need to think a little bit about the used materials in the model. But first you need to uh, select a code that you would like to work according to. In this example we are going to choose the Euro code 1992-2004 without any special national annex. We are going to use material number one for the concrete superstructure made out of C4050 concrete. Although the substructure is made out of the very same material we are going to create a new material in our model but with a different number. Again, this is a good practice that I can recommend for you to do always because later on it will be very easy to distinguish between the concrete stress, for example, 
in material 1 and in material 11. Also other representations can be undertaken via materials. For the reinforcing material we are going to use B500B but again I'm going to create two materials in my model material 2 for the longitudinal reinforcement and with number 3 for the shear reinforcement. The reason behind is that for material 3 although it is made out of the same reinforcing steel I would like to change some of the properties because it's going to be used for shear. Finally the tendons will be created or made out of Y1570 and I'm going to assign this to material number 4 in my model. Now let's take a closer look at the cross-sections. The cross-section of the pier is a standard cross-section with the width of 2.2 meter and the height of 1.0 meter. The cross-section of a superstructure is an arbitrary shape which you can see here. In order to create such a cross-section we are going to use the so-called cross-section editor in Sophiplus later on. We also need to pay attention to the actions that can be defined in the model. These are very important because the superpositioning will be based upon the actions. So the main actions that we need to set up in our model is the G underscore 1, which is mainly for the dead loads, the G underscore 2, which is for the additional dead loads, action P for the pre-stressing, action C to consider the creep and shrinkage effects. The other actions that we are going to set up is the following. Action T for the temperature changes, action ZW for the wind including the traffic loads, action SW considering the wind effects without the traffic, action F to store the settlement loadings in our system, and the traffic loads that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Generally speaking, you can assign the traffic loads to action L and you can set up a subcategory for this action L, for example, action L underscore T. And this action is primarily set up for the tandem load of the load model. Similarly, you can set up an action L underscore U for the uniformly distributed load of the load model and action L underscore 2 for the load group number 2 of the load model which is normally the horizontal loads of the load model. To be consistent with Eurocode table 4.4a basically we can also assign the traffic loads to action GR. The letters GR are referring to the groups of the traffic loads. So instead of L, it is better to use the GR. And therefore, we are going to create action GR underscore T, GR underscore U, and GR underscore 2. I have already shown to you the groups of traffic loads according to table 4.4a from Eurocode. And in our example file, we are going to investigate only the group 1 and the group 2. So basically this case when we have the tandem loads on our structure with the UDL loads of the load model and the frequent values of the GR2 group which is the horizontal loads from the load model. Also it worth thinking about the used load cases and the load case numbers in the model. For the single load cases normally we use the numbers from 1 to 100. Therefore in load case number 1 we defined the dead load of the structure. In load case 2 we added the additional dead load of the structure for example the surfacing, the weight of the asphalt being equal with 2.5 kN per square meter the pre-stressing load, so the curvature load of the pre-stressing which are normally stored in load case 11 or 21 or 31 in our example file we are going to store it in load case 21 
Uh, we also defined two load cases for the wind loads. 31 is together with the traffic load and load case 32 was es established without the traffic loads. The possible settlements has been defined in load case 51, 52 and 53 respectively. Finally, a combination of the constant and the linear temperature change will be created from load case 91 to 98. The predefined load train of model LM1 with the 300 kN axis load will be stored in load case 1200. The result value of the envelope diagram of the traffic loads will be stored in load case 100, 200 and 300 respectively, depending on the actions. A very important aspect of our modeling of this bridge is the construction stages. The presented number of the construction stages and also the scheme of the construction stages in this example file can be used as a standard in your later projects as well. When we introduce a new element in the system, normally we do it in construction stage 10, 20, 30, 40 and so on. Or we can also say whenever we add some additional that type of loading, then we normally do it in construction stage 10, 20, 30, 40 and so on. Then right away activating a new element in our system, we apply the pre-stressing. So that's why the curvature loads are always stored in construction stages 11, 21, 31 and so on. The grouting stage of the pre-stressing tendons happens right after the pre-stressing. So for example, if I pre-stress in construction stage 21, then the grouting will happen in construction stage 22. However, these type of construction stages uh, do not need to be defined explicitly, because other than a change of the cross-section properties, there is no other difference in the model. After the pre-stressing, we normally apply the creep and shrinkage effects and we do it in construction stage 15, 25, 35, 45. There is also a big advantage if you use and follow this scheme. And namely, if you notice, there are some free construction stages that are available. So if you forget something from the modeling or from the construction stages, that you have still spare construction stages to insert. Also, if you have a problem with the analysis of the construction stages, but you followed this scheme and send your model to the support of Sophistic, then the supporter engineer will be able to understand relatively easy what's going on in your model. Okay, basically this is all what I wanted to mention as an introduction to our model that we are going to do together now. In the next part of our training session, we are going to continue with the getting started part. I'm going to show you how to create a new project, then we are going to select the country code, define some materials, define the standard cross-sections, and then the arbitrary master cross-section of the bridge, and then I'm going to show you the basic functionality of SSD. Okay, let's jump right into it. I would like you to start SSD 2020 on your computer. You have two possibilities to do that. The first is to simply go to your desktop, find the icon of SSD 2020 and double click on it. Or the other opportunity is to go to the Windows Start menu, open it up and simply start to type SSD and then 2020 will appear and click on it. Then SSD 2020 will be loaded for you. As the first step, please click on the new project button, which can be seen here. And a new system information dialog box will appear for you. I'm going to go through all the chapters of the system information dialog box. The first chapter is called project, where we can add a name to our database and a title to our project. Please go to the right side of this line and there you will see a folder icon. 
please click on this icon which will direct you to the Windows Explorer. Here you can set up a new folder for your project to be stored. Let's create a new folder together on our desktop. So go to your desktop, right click here and then choose the new folder option. Then please add the name Post Tension Beam Bridge or just simply PTC underscore bridge and enter. Go into this folder by double clicking on it. Then simply add a name for the database which will be also PTC underscore bridge. So what we just did actually we have selected a folder in which the database will be stored and we add a name to our SSD file. The SSD file will be called PTC underscore bridge with an extension of dot sophistic. Now please click on the save button to store this information. Now you can read the location and the name of your project C desktop ptc bridge and ptc underscore bridge dot sophistic file. We can also add a title to our project. For example, post tensioned beam bridge example. And then this title will be plot on every A4 page of the report browser. Of course, in the real project, normally we enter here the project number, the description of the project, and so on and so forth. The next chapter is a very important one. It is the design code. We need to set up a design code at the very beginning of the model creation. And this design code cannot be changed later on. Once you click on the OK button, please do not do it now, then you do not have the possibility to change the design code anymore of the project. Now let's have a look at the predefined codes that you can work according to. If you drop down the list next to this small flag, you will see the available codes to be chosen from. As you can see, we had a lot of predefined codes. For example, if I choose the DIN standard, then the flag is going to change and the DIN AN 1992-2004 will be presented. Or if I choose another country, for example, the Belgium code, then the EN 1992-2004 will be considered according to the national annex of Belgium. In this example file, I would like you to simply choose the general EN without any uh, national annex, please. In the second drop-down list, you can choose the type of the euro code. So, for example, the concrete or the steel or the composite and so on and so forth. For this particular example file, I would like you to choose the 1992-2004, so concrete structures. In the third drop-down list, one can choose between the type of the structure, whether it's the building, footbridge, railroad bridge or road bridge, because according to this choice, the corresponding euro code will be chosen automatically in the background. In our example file, we are going to investigate and analyze a road bridge. That's why please choose the road bridges. If you do so, then the fourth column will automatically fill it out for you and there is no way to choose any other thing here. But if we go back, for example, to the buildings and see what are the possibilities in the fourth drop-down list, you can see that, for example, we can choose between buildings or buildings with bonded tendons. However, please keep with the road bridges and category B. In a few words, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about why it is not possible to change the design code after once you selected it. As you saw, there are a lot of possible predefined codes to choose from. And the users has the feeling that when they are calculating one of the model according to a certain code, and if they just come back here and choose a different uh, code to perform the design according to, then everything will be okay. 
However, this is absolutely not the case. The codes are totally different from each other. The used materials can be different. The safety factor of the used materials. The action types in the codes can be different and also the safety and the combination factors of the actions can be totally different from each other. So basically we would like to avoid the false expectations then one can change between back and forth between the different codes. Okay, having clarified this, let's move on to the next chapter, which is the system chapter. Here you can set up what type of structure you would like to calculate or you would like to deal with. And correspondingly, the system preview will be changed. At the moment, it shows a 2D slab. But if I change it, for example, to a 2D wall, you can see the difference between the 2D slab system and the 2D wall system. If I go and select now the 3D fair system, you can see that in the three-dimensional space, I'm going to handle structural areas, structural lines, or I can say uh, quad elements and beam elements together in one system in the 3D space. If I select now, for example, the 3D frame, again, I'm working in the 3D space, but in this case, I'm going to use only beam elements in the system. If I select the 2D frame, then I'm going to use beam elements in my system in the XY global plane. Or I can also select a 2D girder system. In this case, you can see that my structure is going to be defined in the global XY plane, and I'm only going to use 2D beam elements. Of course, most of the cases, like now as well, we are working with the 3D finite element system. Also, it's worth mentioning, when you choose the 3D finite element system, then the degree of the freedom of the nodes is not going to be limited at all. Whereas, for example, if you choose the 2D wall, or the 2D slab system, some of the degree of freedom of the system will be limited. Now let me introduce to you briefly the calculation chapter. First, the orientation of the dead load needs to be selected. By default, it is set to the negative Z axis. Why is it so important? Because the self weight of the structure is calculated with the help of a body force which has a vector, and you need to instruct the software in which direction this body force vector should point to. Let's imagine that you have a, a slab in this 3D finite element system. The self weight of this slab is going to be calculated as follows. The geometry of the slab gives you an area. The slab itself also has a thickness. If you multiply these two values together, the area and the thickness, you are going to get a volume. If you multiply this volume with the density of the material, then you are going to get the mass of the slab. To get the self weight from this mass as a force, you need to multiply the mass with the gravity. But the gravity has a direction, and this is what you need to specify in this very first input. So in this case it means that we are working in a right-handed coordinate system. You can see the global X, global Y and global Z coordinates and the orientation of the dead load is going to point in the negative direction of the global Z which is fine. If you drop down this, this list you can also see there is the possibility to choose the positive z-axis. But in this case, please also notice that we are working in a right-handed coordinate system again, global x, global y, global z, but the global z direction pointing downwards, and the orientation of the dead load is also pointing in the positive z-axis, which is also pointing downwards, which is fine again. In this chapter, it is also possible to choose from the module to be used for the analysis. Most of the cases only the advanced solution engine is available. But for example, if you choose a 2D wall, 
uh, and for example the plane stress system then you can choose from the advanced solution engine or talpa since our example file is going to be a 3d finite element system then we are going to use the advanced solution engine as a solver the next chapter i'm going to introduce to you is the groups chapter the users need to choose between the two possible options the fix group divisor and the automatic group divisor and this is what I'm going to talk about now I'd like to explain the difference between the fixed group divisor and the automatic group divisor with the help of this slide the maximum number of elements in Sophistic can be described with seven digits so the maximum element number can be 9 million 999,999 in our model we need to set up groups and we are going to assign the different types of structure into different groups for example try to imagine a building where we assign the columns to group 0 the beams in the building will be assigned to group 1 and for example the first floor slab modeled with quad elements will be assigned to group 2 if we chose the fixed group divisor then it would mean that our columns in group 0 will be numbered from 0001 to 9999 this type of numbering is very useful later on when we are going to evaluate our results let's suppose that after the design procedure one of our column is not adequate and cannot resist the load in this case we are going to get an error message from the system stating that the column with number 0021 for example is problematic but with the fixed group divisor it is very easy now to find this element because we know that the column belongs to group 0 and we just need to find the element with number 21 okay so this is the advantage of using this method but there is also a disadvantage for example as I mentioned let's suppose that the slab is assigned to group 2 due to the discretization our structural area is going to be discretized into small finite elements and let's assume that it's going to be more than 10,000 element created this will mean that during the meshing procedure we are going to get an error message that we reach the maximum number of the group divisor and no more quad elements can be created in this case the most obvious solution could be to change the group divisor to a higher number for example to 100,000 but you need to be sure that the maximum number of the elements is not exceeded therefore I'm suggesting you subdividing the group into many more groups so I would keep the group divisor being equal with 10,000 but instead of assign the whole structural area to group 2 I would split it and assign it to group 2, 3 and 4 for example or it is even better to use two digit group numbers and then you can assign your structural area to group 21, 22, 23 for example the other possibility is to use the so-called automatic group divisor with a given value in this approach the element in your system will be automatically assigned to groups and the size of the group is variable the advantage of this method is that you are not going to run out of available numbers at all but it makes finding an element or evaluating the result of an element very very difficult and therefore I encourage you to use the fixed group divisor especially for bridges uh, use this type of method okay now let's go to back to our system information dialog box and go to the next chapter which is about the units the language and the boxed values okay let's move your mouse in the line of the unit set to the right and click on the 
button with the three dots on it. If you do so, you are going to be directed to the units window. Here you can see at the top part the predefined unit sets. As you can see, Sophistic offers you some previously defined unit sets by default. The default setting is the structural engineering unit sets in which the sections are need to be given in millimeter and the system values in meter. For example, the geometry of the structure in meter and the cross-section dimensions in millimeter. But there is another predefined pre uh, unit sets, for example, the metric system, where all the dimensions are in millimeter, even the geometry of the structure and the loads are in kilonewton. Or you can, for example, also choose the mechanical one, where all the dimensions are in millimeter and the loads are in newton. Sometimes in pitch construction, we need to use internal forces in meganewtons because the loads are so high. But all the other geometry values are in meter and the sections are in millimeter. And of course, the imperial units are also predefined in our software. If you choose any of the presets, then you can see below on the tabs which dimensions are going to be considered and also you can see the decimal places of the considered unit. Of course, the units can be changed, for example, the length of the structure instead of meter can be set to millimeter and the decimal pl places to a zero, for example. And with the OK button, you can store this information. But to be honest, I do not recommend to do so. Normally, the predefined or preset values within one unit sets are proper and valid for our analysis. So I will just simply leave this window by clicking on the Cancel button. Now if we move to the next line, which is the language, and you click on the three dot button again, you can see that the language of the input can be changed. Currently there are two languages are available to be chosen from, English and German. For the sake of this tutorial, please leave the language of input on English and click on the Cancel button. If we go to the next line, the location line, and move our mouse to the right side and click on the dot 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 button, then we are going to be directed to the location dialog box. For the general euro code, a lot of uh, entry fields are grayed out, so let's choose a different code. I'm going to simply click on the cancel button and instead of the general euro code, I'm going to choose, for example, the German euro code. And now I'm going to go back to the location settings. And now you can see I have a lot of opportunity to set some values. The main input here is the altitude of the structure. So, for example, if I add here 300 meter, this is the altitude of the structure, of my structure. So, for example, if I input here 300 meter above the sea level, which is the altitude of my structure, in this case, for example, then you can see I have some possibility to choose from the wind type and the category. And based upon these input values, the software will automatically create a wind profile for me. And an automatic generation of a wind load is possible. Similarly, an automatic snow load can be defined here as well. For this particular example file, I'm not going to go through these settings in detail, so just please click on the cancel button for now. Also, please set back the code, the design code of the model to the general Euro code and choose the road bridges as we did previously. In the last line, we can see or we can read the boxed values. And if we go to the settings of these values, we can see that we can control some of the values of the design, of the loading and of the combinations. On the first tab, the 
Safety factors or coefficients used in the design procedure can be seen and can be revised if necessary. For example, if we have a look at the first line, the gum C value is set to 1.5. This value is the safety coefficient for concrete according to Eurocode 1992 1 1 chapter 2.4.2.4. So if you are not sure which value is this exactly, then you can just uh, search for it in the Eurocode in this chapter and you will know that according to your country code the 1.5 value should be used or another value. If you do not agree with this value, just simply need to check the checkbox and overwrite the value of the safety coefficient. However, I do not recommend to do so because most of the cases these values are very well maintained by us and we always overview the change in the national annex of the euro codes and revise these values if necessary. Similarly, some of the loading factors or coefficient can be set on the loading tab. These factors are mainly used for the predefined load trains for their tandem system or uniformly distributed loads. On the last tab, you can also see some reduction factors that can be set manually if you want to. For the time being, I do not want to change any of these box values, so I'm just simply click on the cancel button and leave this window. The last chapter of the system information dialog box is the preprocessing chapter. Here, if you click on the drop down menu, you can choose the preprocessor module or the preprocessor program. By default, it is set to Sophie Plus, but as you can see, you can choose a Teddy input, so a text input, or an input with the Revit user interface, or an input with the Rhino interface, and so on and so forth. For this particular example file, we are going to use the Sophie Plus input. So again, you do not need to change anything here. Okay, as now we went through all the possible settings, let's now click on the OK button. If you do so, then you are going to be find yourself in SSD, the Sophistic Structural Desktop. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about the basic functionalities of SSD. For now, just simply click on this diskette icon to save the project. Before we go on in our model creation, let me talk a little bit about the basic functionalities of Sophistic Structural Desktop. Of course, I'm going to show you these functions live very soon, but first just let me go through some of them. So the SSD, similarly to the modern Windows application, has a ribbon bar at the top where you can see the main icons of SSD. For example, the two main commands that we are using regularly is an insert group and an insert task icon. With the help of these two icons, we can insert a new group in our task tree. And we can also insert a new task within this new group. When you want to insert a new task, the insert new task dialog box will appear. From the list of available tasks, you can select the necessary task you would like to use. And by simply clicking on the OK button, the task will appear in the task tree. This functionality that I had just mentioned can be also achieved with right mouse click on the task tree area. From the presenting pop-up menu, the insert task and an insert new group commands can also be reachable. Another important icon that I would like to mention can be found and seen here. Its name is Explorer and with the help of this icon you can reach the project folder that you are currently working in. 
It's a very useful icon and we are going to use oftentimes in our tutorial because during the analysis of the model we would like to have an overview about the created files in the project folder. In the next slide I'm going to zoom in a little bit about this portion of the ribbon bar and going to explain about these icons in more detail. In one of my previous slides I have already mentioned the system visualization with which we can have an overview of our created discretized finite elements after having exported our system from Sophie Plus to the database. And with the help of system visualization, we can also have a brief overview of our primary results. We can also start an other sophistic program, the graphics, which old name is the wind graph, which enables us to have an overview again about the current model and its result. With this icon, you have a direct access to the result viewer program where you can focus on mainly the input and the output of the cross-section in graphical or in tabular format. You can also access the report browser and here with the help of this little arrow you have the possibility to open up any of the modules report or to open up the overall report of your model. Under the next icon, which name is Database Tools, we can find several more icons or commands. Now I would like to show you the most important one, which is called the Export to DAT. This is a frequently used uh, icon, and with the help of the Export to DAT, we are able to create a TEDI file uh, from the current information of the database. This means the following. Let's imagine that we have created our whole model in Sophie Plus and exported this information to the database. All the structural elements has been discretized or meshed and now in the database we have finite elements. Also assume that we have applied some loadings on the structural elements and this information is also exported into the database. Now, with the help of this export to dot command, we have the possibility to translate this information, this graphical information, into a text input information. If we click on the export to dot button, then this information will be automatically converted into a text file, into a Teddy input, and we are going to be able to see the modules that were necessary to create this input and also all the commands within the CADIMP language that were necessary to create such a model. In this way we can learn a lot of new information regarding the text input, regarding the TEDI and also the CADIMP language because we are able to have a look at behind the scene and now we can understand what is the corresponding command of a certain graphical input. Later on, when we are a little bit more experienced with Sophistic, this approach is also a very good reviewer task or double checker task to see if our graphical input understood correctly by the software. With the help of the text editor icon here, you can open up Teddy within SSD as well. This enables you to open up some of your text input from the project folder, for example. Later on, we are going to use this approach when we run the Construction Stage Manager and we would like to double check the input of the Construction Stage Manager. We can just simply click on this text editor icon and open up the input of the Construction Stage Manager within SSD. With the help of the archive icon, you have the possibility to create a zip file after having finished your project and uh, zip together all the information into one file. The software will automatically choose the most important files that are necessary for archiving. You can share this zip file then later on very easily with your colleagues or you can send it via email.
Here I would like to also mention the clean icon with which you can clean up your project a little bit. For example, you can delete the unnecessary results if you want to, or delete any unwanted files from the project folder. And now I would like to mention the first three icons about the calculation. With the Calculate All button, everything within your project will be analyzed or calculated. With the Calculate Task button, all the graphical tasks can be selected or unselected for an analysis. But one graphical task can contain several modules. With the help of the Calculation button, you are able to select between the modules and you can instruct the software which modules to be calculated and which one to be left out. Personally, I like the calculation uh, the most because with the help of this icon, I can simply select only the wanted modules to be calculated. In the next slide, I would like to talk about the project templates. It's possible from SSD when you click on the File menu to open up a new project from a template file. The template files are stored in the installation directory of Sophistic 2020 SSD templates. In this folder, we are storing some already created or previously created models that can help you to, per to perform a certain analysis type and all the necessary tasks are saved within it. For example, if you want to calculate or you want to perform a fire validation on a structure, you can just simply open up this template file and then you have all the necessary tasks within the task tree. What you only need to do is define the model. Similarly, if you want to, for example, analyze a nonlinear slab according to a certain standard, then you have the possibility to open up this template file and perform the analysis. What you only need to do is to create the model geometry. When you have a project and you think it's a recurring one, so for example, next year you need to analyze the same bridge again, or a very similar one, then you can also save your already created project as a template with the help of save project as template command. It's even possible to save the project as a template with or without the design code that you need to select at the beginning of your project creation. Also in the file menu of SSD, you will find the user option command where you can review and change certain settings. For example, the path of the SSD template files. And in the task defaults, you can set the directory for your template files to be stored. Of course, there are plenty of other settings available for you to make SSD suitable for you the most. I'm not going to cover them one by one now. If we need to make some changes in the settings, then we are going to come back into this place and simply make the changes. The other location where you can uh, make some changes in, is in the SSD file menu and project options. Here you can review or change the setting of your current project. For example, on the Sophistic General, you will see the available language for input and output of your project. And the changes that you made will be saved into a so-called Sophistic.def definition file in the project folder. By the way, this Sophistic definition file can be used also again in your later projects as well. So all the settings saved in the project options can be used later on again. In the next slide, I would like to talk about the SSD menu, the SSD help menu exactly. This time, let's go through from the left to the right. If you click on the small arrow of the user manuals, the following sub-menu will pop up. From here you can reach the basic manual of Sophistic, which describes the main functionalities of the Sophistic software. 
You can also easily open the Design Verification Benchmark Manual, which gives very detailed information about the design procedure of certain models and certain elements of the model. Also, you can open up directly the Mechanical Verification Benchmark Manual. Then, of course, a manual for all of the Sophistic modules can be called up by clicking on the All Manuals button. Nevertheless, you can find these manuals in the Sophistic installation folder. So in Program Files, Sophistic 2020, Sophistic 2020. And if you make a sorting according to the type, you need to find for PDFs. And you will find all of the available modules in this folder. The module name underscore zero dot PDF will guide you to the German manual whereas the underscore one dot PDF will open the English manual. As we are coming back to the help ribbon bar, the next icon I would like to talk about is a log files icon. The log files are containing information about the amended non-conforming behavior of the Sophistic software. In every two months, Sophistic is issuing a new service pack. And in the service pack, as I mentioned, all the problems regarding the software has been amended. You can install the new service pack through the Sophistic Application Manager, in short, SAM. With the help of the Next button, with the Online Help button, you will be able to open up our Online Help documentation site. As you can see on the screen, you will find various types of tutorials regarding bridge design, or steel structure, some geotechnical engineering, dynamic analysis, superpositions, and fire design. Also, this site could introduce you to the general features of Sophistic. The next button, the homepage button, will direct you to the Sophistic homepage, where you can find a lot of information about the current events, for example, and all the necessary things you need to know about the software. The info about button will tell you which service pack are you using currently. This gives us a very important information for us supporters when we need to debug your problem, for example, regarding a certain project file. And we need to reproduce the problem of yours on our computer as well. With the help of the next button, you will be able to open up the license manager. With the license manager, you can manage your license, of course, and you can update your license because it is mandatory and every 13 weeks to update your Sophistic license. With the help of the file associations button, you can associate the file types to certain Sophistic programs. Maybe the most important icon on this ribbon is the support assistant button. This assistant will guide you through the steps of a support request. It will open up a new dialog box, which has four windows. And you need to fill out these windows with the relevant information regarding your problem. And finally, the assistant will send us your request. Then in the support team, we process your question, your inquiry, and respond to you as soon as possible. For the help from our side, we normally use the TeamViewer program, which can be easily start from the help ribbon as well. Okay, after having went through the most frequently used icons within Sophistic, let's go back to our project and continue with the material definition live. Now let us continue with our project model. As I mentioned in one of my previous slides, you can insert a group or a task or copy a task with the help of these icons here. But normally I use uh, the context menu in SSD. This means I'm going to use my right mouse button to insert a group, a task or copy a task. Let me just show it to you. For example, if I would like to insert a new group, then I would click with my right, right mouse button and will select the insert group from the drop-down menu. In this case, a new group 
was inserted right after the group where I previously was. Or in other words, I can also say the new group was inserted right after the lastly selected group. You can add a new name to this uh, group. Let's add just simply text and click on the enter. Now you can see the new group test is selected. Let's insert a new task now. I'm going to use again my right mouse button and from the drop down list I'm going to select now the insert task option. As you can see a new dialog box, namely the insert new task dialog box has appeared. Here you can see a lot of tasks that are available for insertion and they are grouped together according to their types. For example, if I want to insert one of the general tasks that I can select the text editor or the user text for insertion. Or if I would like to insert some calculation related task, then I can find those below the calculation chapter. Now I would like you to select the text editor and click on the OK. You will see that now this task has been inserted below the test group. As the text editor selected now, please click with your right mouse again, right mouse button again, and insert a new task. This time, please choose the linear analysis task and click on the OK. Finally, I would like to insert our last task, which should be for example, the thermal analysis task and click on the OK button. The reason why I asked you to do so is to show you how easy it is to change the order of the tasks. If I now, for example, select the text editor with my left mouse button and start to drag it, you can see that a line will be presented at the location of the task at the current time. Now, for example, we can see that my text editor task will be inserted between the linear analysis and the thermal analysis task because the continuous back line, black line is in between the linear analysis and the thermal analysis tasks. And as I released it, you can see that really I moved my text editor in between the before mentioned two tasks. Now I would like to show you how easy it is to copy one task. Again, we can work with our right mouse button. If you do so, then you have the option to select the copy task. If I click on it with my left mouse button, then the text editor task was copied over. There is also another way to copy a task. What you need to do is simply start to drag the task and while you are dragging with your left mouse button, you simply push simultaneously the control button and then you select the location where you want to copy over the task and release the left mouse button. And now really a copy of the copy of the text editor has been created and inserted at desired location. Okay, as now we went through the basic principles of the task insertion copy and also the creation of the groups, I would like to, to delete what we just created. So please select uh, the lastly created task and click with your right mouse button and choose the delete from the pop-up menu. When we are going to get a question from the system, are you sure you want to delete the task? Yes. And now, as you can see, the task has been deleted. Now I will show you, if you delete a group, then all of the contained tasks will also be deleted. So if I right-click on the test group and select the delete, and I will click on the yes now, the group has been deleted with all the tasks within it. So now we get back to the original status of our tasks in our project. Now with the knowledge of the context menu usage in SSD, I'm going to show you how to create new materials. Please select the materials task 
and click with your right mouse button. From the drop-down list, please choose the new material from design code option and you will be directed to the design code material dialog box. Now I will go through this window in detail. In the top left corner first you can see that uh, the number of the material can be given. This number later on cannot be changed, so you need to be careful with the numbering. The title of the material can be entered manually according to your wish, but based upon your type of material and the classification, an automatically generated name will be offered for you. For example, let's choose the type of the material from standard concrete to standard reinforcing steel and change the classification to P500B. As you can see, the maximum thickness, or in this case the maximum diameter, has already been shown automatically. According to our model description, a reinforcing steel should be created for the normal reinforcement and with number 3 for the shear reinforcement. That is the reason why I'm going to add a suffix to, to the title of the material. I will simply add stirrup to the title just to show that this material is specially made for the stirrups. If you make a closer look at the dialog box, we can see that we have three different tabs in it. The Properties tab describes the general properties of the material, such as the self-weight, density, elastic modulus or Poisson ratio. The Strengths tab shows other general properties, such as the yield strengths, the tensile strengths of the material, if you would like to change any of the values, you just simply need to tick in the checkbox and change the value according to your wish. In this case, I'm going to ch change the allowed stress range of the stirrup material to be equal with 80 megapascal. On the third tab, a bedding can be assigned to the certain material. However, you cannot utilize this feature for the reinforcing steel material, but you can do it for other type of material, such as concrete. I will show it to you later on. However, what is important to mention and show is the stressed strain curves of the material. If you open up the window, you will see again three new tabs. One tab is for the ultimate limit state description, Another one is for the serviceability limit state, and the third one is for the calculatoric mean values. As I am clicking through these tabs, the different diagrams on the left side will be highlighted with red color. So now the calculatoric value curve is shown with red, now the serviceability curve, and now the ultimate limit state curve is highlighted. The corresponding stress strain point of the diagram can be found and activated with this supporting points checkbox. What I mean by activating is that if you want to change any of the values within the stress strain curve, you need to activate the points and then you can override any of the value values that you want. However, I do not recommend this. These diagrams have been created based upon your chosen code, in this case EN1992-2004, and the reinforcing steel material has been taken over from this code. So the given values are fulfill the requirements of the chosen code. You can also add new lines by clicking on the new button or delete any of the lines by clicking on the delete button. You can simply create a symmetric type of stress strain curve and you can also cut off the tension part of the presented material workflow. In this example I'm satisfied with the default values that the software is suggesting for me, so I just simply uncheck the supporting points box.
and leaving the dialog box by clicking on the OK button. Once more, I'm going to click on the OK to create this material with number 3. As you can see, I have set up a new material for the stirrup made out of B500B steel material. If I review my project plan or project description, you can see that I need to set up material number one. If I now review the prescription of the model file, we can see that we need to create a concrete with a classification of 4050 with the material number of 1. And we also need to create a new material with number 11 made out of the same concrete. This means that I need to change the properties of material number 1. You can do that by simply double clicking on the material number 1. As you can see, an already defined material number cannot be changed later on. This field is grayed out. However, it is allowed to change the classification of the material. In this case, instead of 25, we should choose 40. And then click on the OK. Now we reach what we want to and material number 1 has changed to C4050. Now I would like to show you how to copy this material number 1 into material 11. All you need to do is use your right mouse button again and choose the clone option. Now we just need to enter a new material number which will be 11 in our case and then click on OK. Now you can see a new material has been created with number 11 and the classification is exactly the same as the original one. The only material that remained for definition is the material of the tendons. As you can see, we need to set up a new pre-stressing steel material with a number of 4. But we already know how to do that. We just simply right-click on the materials and click on the new material from design code. And from the design code material dialog box, we need to change the type, drop down the list and choose the pre-stressing steel. And in the classification field, we need to select the 1570C. We need to pay attention to the material number, but in this case, this is what I want. I would like to create a new material with number 4. So I just simply need to click on OK and accept it. As now we are finished with the generation of the materials, please click on the diskette icon to save the project. What I wanted to show you additionally is how to define bedding to a material. If you double click on the first material, we are, we are back in the design code material dialog box and for the concrete it is possible to define bedding on the bedding tab. You just simply need to click on the activate checkbox and here you have the possibility to input explicitly an elastic constant value which is perpendicular to the surface of the elements and an other value explicitly which is going to be tangential to the surface of the elements. Since our example file doesn't contain any bedding of any of the materials, I'm just going to simply leave this dialog box for now with clicking on the cancel button. Now I would like to have an overview of our defined materials. We can get it if we simply right click on the materials again and from the drop-down list we choose the Calculate Materials. Basically, every task in the task tree can be run in the very same manner. It was very quick, but actually the Materials task has been run and now we can see what module in the background was run actually. In this case, Module Aqua was run, the title of it was Materials, and we can see it run without any errors or any warnings. And you can also see, as I mentioned before, that this area of the SSD now changed to uh, analysis protocol. 
Here you can also see which program module was run, how long does it take to run, and then you can see end of the calculation. If we now go to the materials and right click on it, a new subchapter can be seen, namely the reports. If you click on it, you will be directed to the report browser. First, please have a look at the location of this file. You will find your project folder and then the name of the project with underscore 003.plb. From this information, one can figure out that the extension of the report browser files is the PLB. The number of the report after the underscore sign was added automatically by the software. But later on, when you become an experienced user, you can also control this number with the text input. Now let's see what kind of information the report browser offers us. So basically, as you can see on an A4 paper, we have text and tabular information about the task. The name of the chapters can be seen with bold letters. This chapter can be found on the left side as well. And the chapters are presented with an open book. If the book is open, then it means that that chapter is going to be presented in the report. However, if I close a chapter, it is not going to be presented anymore. Please notice that the input data chapter by default is closed, so not presented. If you open it up, you will be able to see the underlying Teddy code of this task. I would suggest to only open and present the chapters that you really need, because as you can see at the bottom part, only the material reports is consisting of seven pages. Hence, I'm going to close back the input data and, for example, the thermal material constant because we are not going to need it in this example file at all. But you can also realize that in the report browser we have some very nice pictures. The pictures can be activated and deactivated by clicking on their icon. If you want, you can have a look at only the pictures or graphics separately on the Graphics tab. Here you will find the graphics that is incorporated in the results in a much bigger scale and it's better to overview the graphics here. As I mentioned, sometimes the content of the report browser file is too much or too few. Hence, you can control it via the graphical input. Let me show you how. If we go back to SSD and we are right-clicking on the materials, this time we should choose the Edit option. With the help of this newly popped up dialog box, we can control the output of our task in the report browser. If we choose the full text output, that every possible output will be presented in the report browser. If we choose the no text output, then this task is not going to create any report browser file. If we choose the manually control, then we have the option from the available described. If we choose the manually controlled possibility, then we have the option to choose from a drop down list and select the value of ourself. If we choose the manually controlled option, then we have the possibility to, to choose the value of ourselves. For example, I can even choose to get an extended output of the material values. For the time being, just simply leave this dialog box with the cancel. And that concludes our material definition part. And we are going to continue with the definition of the cross sections. So, in the next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the cross-section definition. In order to be able to define a cross-section, first we need to set up the materials in our model. Here on the picture, for example, you can see a standard T-shaped cross-section made out of a concrete material 
and also the reinforcing steel for the longitudinal reinforcement and for the shear reinforcement is provided. In the second slide you can see an arbitrary shaped cross-section made in the so-called cross-section editor. The cross-section editor can be reached within SOFIPLUS, so you must have a SOFIPLUS license to be able to create arbitrary shaped cross-sections. In SOFIPLUS or in SSD, there are two different types of representation for different type of cross-sections. If a cross-section shown with its outline and it is filled with green color, it means that it's a properly defined standard cross-section. If you can see a cross-section with a green outline without any fill, then it means that it is a user-defined cross-section. It can also happen that you can see these shapes with red color. It means that something is not proper with the definition of the cross-section and the software cannot work further on with this cross-section. So you need to do some amendments here. Now I'd like to explain what is the difference of the two major types of the cross-section, namely between the standard cross-sections and the user-defined cross-sections. Maybe the best way is to explain this difference through this slide. If you go back to SSD and right-click on the cross-section task, this new pop-up window will appear on the screen. Here you can also realize the distinguish between the new standard cross-section definition and a new solid or a new thin-walled section definition. The new solid section and the new thin-walled section are freely defined or user-defined sections, whereas the standard cross-section are already created, predefined and in the library for you. Even the icon representation of the two types is different. The standard uh, cross-section is represented with a filled green section mark, whereas the user-defined cross-section types are marked with green unfilled cross-section sign. Okay, now let me explain what is a standard cross-section type. So the standard cross-sections are the most commonly used section in the civil engineering practice, such as rectangular beam, T-beam, a horizontal or a vertical plate element, a cable element, or a rolled steel shape. Due to the known geometric structure of the cross-section, most of the property values can be calculated in a direct way, allowing to skip the time-consuming detailed analysis of the shear or plastic resistance. In many cases, uh, these values are simply taken over from tabulated data from the literature. The disadvantage of using this type of cross-section is the limited variability and the location of the design points within the cross-section. A detailed analysis or a combination with other cross-section part is only possible for the rolled steel profile sections here. Therefore, for all the other cross-sections, it is not possible to perform the fatigue design or calculate the phone meso stresses. Okay, now let's discuss the new thin walled sections, which is a user-defined cross-section type. A thin walled cross-section may contain any number of thin elements, which means that the thickness of the element is much smaller compared to, the, to its length. When we use these thin elements in the cross-section, we assume that the variation of the normal stress and most shear stresses over the thickness are negligible. In other words, we assume that the shear stresses or the normal stresses along the element is not changing, but constant. This has the consequence, if we consider one thin element in our cross-section, that the moment of inertia about its weak axis is also vanishing, or very, very small. The available uh, element type within a thin walled cross-section are the panels, standard steel shapes, welded joints, and also, very interestingly, but reinforcement as well. Section moduli for all the stresses are available at all points of the cross-section. 
the torsional moment of inertia and the warping resistance as well as the center of the shear and the shear deformation areas are all determined for open and closed shapes. But of course, if you want, they can also be specified explicitly for special cases, for example, when you don't agree with the calculated value or some other cases as well. And composite cross-sections can be also defined with the help of thin-walled cross-sections. Now let's have a look at the freely defined solid sections. A freely defined solid cross-section consists of any number of outer and inner perimeters in the form of polygons or circles and you can also implement reinforcement elements within these solid cross-sections. Furthermore, it is also possible to define structural steel shapes. These can also be integrated in the cross-section. The section moduli for all stresses are only available at distinct points at the cross-sections. Therefore, you need to define these stress points or distinct points. The torsional moment of inertia, the center of shear, and the shear deformation areas can be calculated or they can be input separately. This means that, of course, the software will calculate you for you these values. If you do not agree with it or you want to overwrite it explicitly, it's possible as well. You can create or define composite sections with solid sections as well. And it's also possible to add effective width of the polygons within the cross-section. So this means you can create areas within the cross-sections that are non-effective. In the next slide I would like to briefly go through the standard cross-section types. Let me talk about first the rectangular beam and the T-beam in connection with each other first. I would like to do that because basically they are very similar to each other. A rectangular beam is nothing more than a very special T-beam because this special T-beam plate width is equal with the web width and then we are going to get the normal rectangular beam. In the standard concrete cross sections you can define reinforcement layers. For example, the bottom reinforcement bars creates the bottom reinforcement layer, which normally we number with layer 1. Similarly, the top reinforcement layer in a rectangular cross-section is assigned to layer 2. The side reinforcement on both sides are assigned to layer 3. The same numbering is applicable for the T-shaped beam section, the T-beam. The rectangular column cross-section is a little bit of different from the rectangular beam. Although the shape is the same or very similar, the reinforcement layers are different. In the rectangular column cross-section, since it is mostly a compressed member, there will be only one layer of reinforcement be created and it is numbered with layer 0. The plate standard cross-section type is to model, for example, a strip of a slab. It is very similar to the rectangle beam, but there is no side reinforcement in it. With the wall type of standard cross-section, you can model a cross-section of a vertical wall, for example. Again, it is very similar to the rectangle beam, but there is no side reinforcement in it. It is also possible to define a circle or annular section with reinforcement in it as well. Then we also have some very special cable elements made out of steel material. And it doesn't mean only a circular shaped cross section, but you can also have this type of cable section as well. Many others can be chosen from the drop down list in the definition of the cross-section of the cables. And finally, it is also possible to define steel profiles as standard cross-section. On the next slide, I would like to simply show you the dialog box of the definition of the standard cross-section. 
basically you can set the properties of the cross section on the left side and on the right side you can see a live preview of the settings if you want to define a user defined cross section then you can do that in the so-called cross section editor as you can see this type of cross section can be very easily defined in the AutoCAD based environment the real execution with the help of this lot of comments will be covered later on when we create our user defined cross section for the bridge section so now I would like to just briefly go through the two types of the user defined cross sections namely the solid cross section and the thin wall cross section if you choose to create a solid cross section type from the drop down list you can choose three types the reinforced concrete the composite or steel or the general if you want to create thin wall cross section then you have four possibilities to do that if you set up a solid reinforced concrete solid cross section then you can only use concrete and reinforcing steel material in the cross section all the comments for a solid section definitions are available for you and the analytical parameters are set to be calculated according to a composite section if you choose a general solid section type then basically everything is free free choice of materials all the commands for solid sections are available but you need to pay attention because there are no default settings everything needs to be adjusted by yourself okay now let's go through the thin wall cross section types you can define a thin wall reinforced concrete cross section the use case is of this selection is when you try to create a composite cross section made out of thin walled elements in this case only concrete and reinforcing steel materials are allowed and steel profiles are not allowed to be imported in this thin walled cross section this means if you want to implement a steel profile you need to create this steel profile with the help of plate elements in the cross section if you choose the thin walled steel cross section type then only metallic materials are allowed in this case you cannot define any reinforcement in the cross section when you select to create a thin wall composite section you have a free choice of material all the commands with which you can create a thin wall element are available and finally when you have a thin wall general cross section then again everything is free free choice of material selection all the thin world commands are available for you but every settings needs to be adjusted by yourself okay that concludes the theory of the cross-section definition now let's go back to our model and create the peer cross-section which will be a standard cross-section in this case if the SSD file is not yet open please go to the desktop PTC bridge and open up the PTC bridge.sophistic file then you will see SSD opened on your screen like on mine so the way how we can create a new cross section is the usual right hand mouse click and from the drop down list please choose the new standard section and rectangle column please from the training example drawing I would like to show you as a reminder that we should create now a 2.2 by 1 meter rectangle column section okay let's fill out this dialog box according to this little sketch first the number of the cross section should be given I would like you to change it to number two because uh, the cross section number one I would like to reserve for the master cross section of the bridge and this cross section is created for the pier for the name you can add any arbitrary name but it is going to be automatically filled out based upon the dimension of the cross section what is most important for the definition of the cross section is to choose a material from which the cross section will be created in this case I would like to change it to uh, material number 11 which is exactly the same 
concrete material, but I specially created this material in order to distinguish between the results of the master cross-section and the peer cross-section. If you forgot to create a new material for this cross-section, then you have the possibility to do so here by clicking on this new icon. Also, you have the possibility, if you think that you should change any of the properties of the already defined material, then you have some opportunity to do so here again with this property button. Now, the other material that we need to assign to the cross-section is the reinforcing steel material. In this case, for this cross-section, in the longitudinal reinforcement direction, material 2 is sufficient for me. In the next the geometry chapter, we should define the dimension of the cross-section. Please enter the width of the cross-section to be equal with 2200 mm and the height to be equal with 1000 mm. Next, you need to define the reference point of the cross-section. By default, it is set to be equal with the gravity center here. The reference point means that the cross-section will be inserted into a model referred to the point that we choose here in the cross-section. If I select, for example, an explicit offset and input some values, for example, 500 mm and 500 mm, then you can see, then what you can realize is that this reference point changed its position and it can be located somewhere here on the bottom fiber of the cross section. And this means this is going to be the location of the neutral axis of our finite element beam. In this exercise, I would like to insert my cross section in a centric way, so I just simply set the reference point back to the gravity center. In the next chapter, we need to define the reinforcement in the cross section. By default, the arrangement of the reinforcement is to put corner bars in the four corners of the cross-section. If you click on this input and drop down the list, you can see all the possibilities for the reinforcement definition arrangement. You can put one bar in every corner. You could put two bars in the corner for the MY bending moment. You can put two rebars in every corner against the MZ bending moment. You can insert three rebars in the corners, and so on and so forth. What I would like you to choose here is the circumferential reinforcement arrangement. As you can see, the reinforcement arrangement on the right side changes right away. You can also control the reinforcement arrangement with giving the minimum distance, the maximum distance between the bars, and so on and so forth. But what is important than that is to define the diameter and the effective distance of the rebars. The effective distance of the rebars are measured from the fibers to the center point of the rebars. So it's not equal with the concrete cover. Okay, for this particular column, I found this 50 millimeter a little bit too few or too small, so just set it to 100 millimeter and then click on into the diameter field. In this field you can enter the diameter of the rebar, but basically the, this only affects the calculation of the crack width in the cross section. For a normal ULS design what is important is where the reinforcement bars are located within the cross section and the amount of the reinforcement within the cross-section. For the time being, I will leave it on 12 mm and I will click in the minimum reinforcement field. I would like to explain now a little bit about the minimum reinforcement. As you can see, it is given in centimeters square and what it means is, during the design procedure of the cross-section, software will take this minimum amount of reinforcement and see or check if the reinforcement is capable 
of which stand the most severe external loading. If it is not the case and the cross-section is not adequate, then the software will automatically start to increase the amount of minimum reinforcement. And in the report browser, finally, you will see the required amount of reinforcement. OK, now, if you made all the settings here like I did, please click on the OK button. And as you can see now, a new cross-section with number 2 with the given dimensions has been created. OK, let's calculate the cross-sections task by right-click on it and choose the Calculate Cross-sections. As you can see in the background, Module Aqua was running again. Now if we right-click on the cross-sections task and open the report from the drop-down list, we can have a look at the properties of the cross-section. If I scroll up with my mouse to see the first page, what I will find is a graphic of the cross-section and above it I can see the cross-section static properties. If I now click on the reinforcement global values and zoom in a little bit, what we can see is the following. You can see that in the cross-section there is only one reinforcement layer minimum and the layer number is zero. The cross-section is made out of material 11, which is a concrete material. The reinforcing material is number 2. And you can also find the minimum amount of reinforcement within the cross-section. OK, basically that concludes the introduction of the cross-sections. OK, and we are going to continue with the creation of the master cross-section of the bridge in the next block.